about uh, spatial data and uh, how to handle them. Um, so the overview of the talk, um, I will talk a little, quite a bit about uh, how maps are plotted, um, about the, the question what, what straight lines mean when, we, when, the, when, the, when the Earth is a sphere. Um, I will say something about handling large spatial data sets with R, say a little bit about the life cycle of R spatial packages and, um, and say something about the R spatial community and how we interact with, uh, with other communities. Uh, here is, an, um, here is a, a link to the slides that I will copy in the, uh, I will try to copy that in the chat uh, to everyone. Um, I don't think that is an option to share that with everyone, but to the panelists and maybe they could forward it to, to somewhere else. From there you will, uh, you will find the, um, basically the, um, the slides themselves and also the, uh, the R markdown that was used and the R code that was used to generate most of the pictures. Although now and then I, I, I cheated here and there. Um, yeah, so how do we plot maps? This is an interesting question. Um, the problem is that unless you're in the actual in the business of creating globes, uh, then then basically every everything you do is a is a two dimensional plot of, of things of earthbound data that and that involves projection, right? The Earth is round, is a sphere, and uh, and anything that you look at, even even the image you're looking at, the image you look at, and and a little animation on the top on the on the bottom left is a, is a projection, and and that's a a, a 2D thing of something that is not uh, 2D. So that is a problem. And, um, and so you quickly run into this problem. And so I had an example here of, an, you know, a fairly arbitrary, uh, but well-known and respected data scientist active on, uh, on Twitter, trying to make a maps and trying to running into the problem of, of, uh, of, of having spatial data and having to make a map and, and sort of the problem like, okay, what do, what, what do I, what am I going to do here? And, there was a nice uh, uh, thread and a follow-up advice and so on that was very helpful. It was good. But anyone doing this basically runs into, you know, creating something and then basically you ask what to do and you think, oh, well, there might be uh, a plot command. So let's try this. Like, let's try to plot this map, right? World map and we plot it. And then we see this. And then you think, oh, my, ah, luck, you know. Ah, I'm done, right? Here's a world map and everyone recognizes this as a world map. Of course, he, uh, yeah, there's a couple of issues with it. it I mean, uh, besides that it is flat. Um, the thing I learned in, in uh, primary school, actually, looking at world maps, is that, that this island here, the island of Guinea, is kind of half the size of Greenland, right? And, and if that is not the case, then, then something is wrong with that map, right? So you see that there's a, there's a strong distortion here in that kind of... Uh, of course, you see it if you look at Antarctica, that is the largest continent on this map, which it isn't, right? Everyone knows that. So, so there are some weird distortions going on. And essentially, where this came from, why we do it this way, I, I try to dig it up. And, and you know, I always think that I came, that with, came up with that myself, but of course I didn't. So there is this package maps, and the package maps is really an ancient R package. It says something like, you know, 2003, the first version, but it's probably older. It's just, this is probably where the Cron archives start. And it says, based on older work uh, by, uh, I think, Richard Becker uh, and, and Alan Wilkes or something like that in S+. So this is really from the old S+, plus days. And um, they made maps like this. You would say map world and map USA. You've got this, this map. And it had an argument projection and it had possibilities to use with the map project library to do projections. But it said this, the default is to use a rectangular projection with the aspect ratio chosen so that longitude and latitude scales are equivalent at the center of the picture, right? And that is what we see here. Basically, latitude and longitude are basically mapped to X and Y. And so on the equator, we have one kilometer east is one kilometer north. And off the equator, this is not true, right? Things are stretched, are really stretched kind of uh, in east-west direction. And so you see that the United States, for instance, has a very different, very much more elongated shape here than here, because for this map, again, the, the aspect ratio was chosen such that in the center of the map, one, well, it will be one mile, one mile north will be one mile east, right? So we, we have, that at least some kind of you know useful scale for for limited areas 
um, and and for the shape we have to see whether this is you know this is a good way of of displaying uh, things in any case this is where it came from and this is now what we do and it's just one of the many things you can do there is a very nice xkcd where Randall Munro um, comments on on the on this particular projection which we call pat carré you think this one is fine you like how x and y map to latitude and longitude the other projections overcomplicate things you want me to stop asking about maps so you can enjoy dinner and this was probably you know the authors of this maps package 40 years ago and, and, and me like like almost 20 years ago, I think, oh yeah, this is easy, this is cool and so on. Of course you can go for a globe, but Munro was not so very positive about that, uh, about that either, right? Um, being sarcastic there. So there is a, you know, a couple of things with projections. The thing is that for small areas, usually not such a big issue because anyway, you have pretty much a flat, a flat space. You don't, you don't notice that the earth is round and Projections cannot preserve distances, yeah? So you lose that in any case. And then they can preserve something. They can either preserve area or shape or directions uh, or some compromise of these things. Yeah, and, and another aspect is that there are so many projections. There are even, you know, nowadays people who create new ones. Um, there's also no need for the North to be up or for Europe to be in the middle, right? These are arbitrary choices. But doing, you know, a random rotation of the Earth and then uh, sort of an unfolding into a projection is often hard to read. It's a nice exercise, but it's not it's not easy to communicate these things like that. So here are a couple of alternatives. This is the one that we looked at, which is the default you get from SF, from SP, and from GMSF and GGplot2. Uh, this is also one that everyone knows. It's the Web Mercator. Um, and it's the one used in, in Leaflet and, uh, and MapView. So any, any kind of web interface that uses these tiled backgrounds, um, uh, Google Maps has this as one of the options. And that's basically where it came from. And, um, and you see there's much more distortion here if you look at the relative size of this island in Greenland. Um, but if you zoom in and you look at local areas, it's pretty good because it preserves shapes, right? It doesn't not, not like here that, that everything becomes becomes very flattened. So so for the purpose of, of being doing local analysis, web marketer is not even such a bad idea. But if for for creating global for creating political maps, for instance, uh, it is it is of course terrible because Greenland looks like the largest thing in, in Antarctica. You can't even do it. It kind of disappears because it it gets too large. Um, so this, does, this doesn't work for global maps. Um, alternatives are there, for instance, the Equal Earth Projection and Eckhart 4, which is used by TMAP and the TMAP package. Um, and these are sort of very good alternatives that in any case that preserve shape, as you can see here. If you, uh, if you add Tissot's indicatrices, which are basically circles that have an equal shape and size, if when you would, when you would draw them on the globe, Right, and, and, and they are basically here uh, uh, projected and then you can see the deformation. You can see that they get elongated on the, in, on the plat carré and that they, get, that they keep the same shape but get much, much and much larger when you look at Web Mercator. And for Equal Earth, you see that they get different, sha they get different shapes but they remain the same area on Equal Earth and, and pretty much also on the, uh, on the Eckhart 4. So these, are, these would be good alternatives. Looking at, at, at more regional maps, you know, we don't always make global maps, but, but if projections are a problem and we would do this for large regions, for instance, for a continent, then of course the most extreme example is, would be Antarctica, right? If we plot it in equidistant cylindrical, we, we get something like this, where we have this entire line, which is essentially the, the South Pole, right? Anything else, Lombard Equal Area or Orthographic, which is basically the globe view, but then centered on, on Antarctica, uh, would, would give something like this. Um, and for for North America, we, we see something like this, where, where Greenland and again is ex incredibly uh, exaggerated, and on Lombard, Lombard equal area or orthographic projections looks actually much uh, much nicer in the sense of that the area proportions are um, are more realistic. Yeah, so they they give much more better views on this. So then the question comes like like what is a straight line? How we how do we deal with straight lines in in uh, spatial data? And the thing is that for simple features, which is basically the way we, we, we nowadays handle spatial data like points, lines, and polygons, in any case, lines and polygons, is that, that we, we handle, we, we say things are feature. Features means it's an abstraction of a real world phenomena, and it, it can be anything like, like a house or a parcel or a country or a region. 
and it has in any case geometrical properties and that for simple features the simple really means that we describe the geometric attributes as piecewise uh, piecewise by straight lines or planar interpolation between sets of points so we have uh, a line we have a curve essentially that we approximate by piecewise by, by sections of straight lines right otherwise we can't handle it that is essentially what it what it comes back to so why is this such a big deal well it's a big deal because straight lines after reprojection are no longer straight lines so you have to ask you have to wonder where in which projection are they straight because if you do something else they're no longer straight and then there's for instance the geojson ietf standard which prescribes how geojson which is a which is a json format popular by web developers um, should handle uh, spatial data and they say a line between two, two positions is a straight cartesian line the shortest line between those two points in the coordinate reference system and in the next line or in the next section or something like that they say the coordinate reference system is a geographic coordinate reference systems meaning degrees latitude longitude using wgs84 as the datum yeah, so so these are latitude longitude degrees yeah but assuming straight cartesian lines essentially in this space right in in, in the space of, of of this projection yeah and that is that is an interesting uh uh, finding and the question is whether uh, for instance geojson users realize that because of course you often you know have a database and you convert data you take it out and you use basically something as an intermediate format and then push it into some web something some web application and um that's you know that is the question what whether everyone realizes that the standard basically assumes that so looking at a few uh at, at here a very contrived example if we have a straight line between two points on Antarctica on this particular projection and we project that line then that line should actually be like this so it basically is more than a half circle around the south pole right which looks like a straight line here and looks like a curved line here and then the other the other way around if we have a straight line on this Lombard equal area projection or if we have a, a great circle a distance basically the shortest distance over the sphere between these two points we would project it back to here it looked like this and you see that it crosses the anti-meridian so it goes basically from one half of the earth to the other half and continues here so how do we do these kind of actions right if we would just say we take these two points and we say it's a line yeah, and we project the that line we say we basically project these two points and we get this line out right which is an entirely different thing right we want to get this one out so we do that by adding uh points on that straight line yeah and then basically assuming short straight lines between these points and then transforming all these points and then we have a new straight we have a curved line here which is a, a sequence of, of small sort of you know they should be curved made, but if we take them for straight then this still works out right and the other way around we we basically note things here and we get something out there yeah so we can always add nodes and we can also we can also remove them we can simplify and we could simplify this one to uh you know to these two endpoints but then uh if we sort of transform that again then of course that leads to confusion you don't end up with with the line that you basically have in mind in some other projection yeah, so these are things to 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 be aware of to take care of. Uh, one of the one of the bigger uh, things that I've been involved with in uh, our in our spatial uh, for the last uh, one and a half year is, uh, is is that of spherical geometry, right? And um, so since about a month ago or so, we have this package SF, which is used by a lot of other packages to basically to represent uh, um, spatial data in in this in the point lines of polygons or vector uh, data um, with coordinate reference systems um, uh, with, with, with coordinates. Essentially, we, we, re, we um, have now the case that if these data are represented by ellipsoidal coordinates, so expressed as longitude latitude degrees, um, we uh, use spherical geometry. So we basically assume that they are on a sphere rather than in a, in a flat plane, right? And it, that sounds like a crazy idea. Like, why wouldn't you do that, right? Uh, the same people would say, obviously you would do that. Well, the thing is that like for 50 or more years, we have not done that. We have basically assumed that these two live in the plat carré space of a flat, like, like GeoJSON just assumes that writes that literally on paper that we should assume it's like that. Uh, no, we don't do that anymore. 
And now a lot of things actually run much better in the sense that we can do buffering, we can do geometric predicates on the sphere, we can do distances on the sphere and so on. So you don't have to, by doing that, you essentially don't have to worry more uh, anymore about going to a particular projection and that choosing this projection has an effect on what you do. No, you just do things on the sphere. Of course, ideally, you would do things on an ellipsoid, which is the, uh, even a better approximation of the sphere, but the difference between a sphere and an ellipsoid is really, really very small and sort of uncomparable to the difference between something that is flat and an ellipsoid. So one could go back to the sort of the pre, um, pre-SF uh, one zero behavior by setting a, a couple of flags and you get the, the old, uh, you get the old behavior. Um, and there's more discussion on this issue um, actually in the uh, upcoming book uh, on spatial data science that Roger Bevan and I are, are um, finishing up. And you also need to sort of look at the work that Dewey Dunnington did. Dewey Dunnington mostly wrote uh, the S2 package, which is basically uh, the underlying the SF package for doing all the spherical geometrical operations. So we have now two engines, basically one spherical engine and one flat engine, depending on when you have unprojected data, ellipsoidal coordinates or projected data, um, which are then handled by the sort of the flat space uh, geometrical uh, libraries. Um, right. Um, another issue that uh, that comes up that is sort of uh, worth uh, discussing is that of uh, handling large spatial data sets uh, with R. So there is, you know, in general, sort of handling large data sets uh, with R is an, is an interesting uh, topic and, and different, you know, different um, groups or, or, or lines of thought have, have, have done that in, in, in different ways. If you look at tidyverse, it is much more sort of an interface to databases where the data might live. Yeah, you, your, your data might be in a in a, in a, a big query SQL uh, Google database, and you, you basically write your your code in, in tidyverse and have an interface to the database that carries out the the, the, the hard work on the on the large data sets. And basically, you look at the reduced results of of operations on that. Uh, with spatial data, it is a little bit uh, different in the sense that a lot of spatial data doesn't live in in databases, doesn't live in tables, or the tables don't don't work so really well. Although, for instance, for vector data, you could use Google BigQuery, uh, GIS, which is which is an which is a way to to do that, or or other spatial databases that are that are there to uh, to do similar things. And there have been uh, reports of of successfully doing that actually with the DB plier interfaces, which is which is uh, very interesting. So it, you can essentially uh, have the case that all your data can can be held in memory. Yeah, I always sort of buy laptops with the maximum amount of memory that I can afford, or that my institute can afford. So I can do experiments with like you know up to whatever 48 gigabytes of RAM or something like that. Yeah, so um, packet the most spatial packages uh, basically hold um, elements in in in, in memory. And some of them go further and sort of say, okay, now I assume my, my data is on local storage, it's on hard drive, and they will not load everything in memory. So raster and Terra, and to some extent, stars also are packages that, that work with raster data mostly, so image data, um, and, and those are mostly uh, larger and, and basically uh, allow you to make expressions. And then if you want to compute things, it's going to go through all these imagery. And so without sort of trying to load everything in memory, because that will not work anyway. And then there's a third category, and that, that is basically the category where you have data that are not, you know, that you're not going to download, right? So, so there's a lot of data now available for free, like weather data, there's ERA-5 weather reanalysis data, the climate modeling intercomparison program, CMIP-6, uh, and an enormous amount of Earth observation data that is all in principle for free, and you can usually download sections of those, but you're not going to download everything simply because the network is not going to allow you. We think we have fast networks, but if the problem is suddenly that you have to download three petabytes, petabytes even if you had the local storage to, you know, to hold that, um, it's, it's going to, to take you know, years or so to, to move this data. Yeah, so this is really a thing where, where the network bandwidth hasn't held up with, uh, with, the data vol with the volumes of the data that we collect. And nevertheless, all these data are very relevant for, you know, for, for questions for related to sustainability and for the effect of climate impact or weather extremes and so on, or for emergency satellite data. 
So, um, so this is stated that we would like to be able to use much easier than we can. A platform that can do that is, for instance, Google Earth Engine and now a couple of other platforms that in the similar fashions allow you to work with large data sets in the cloud through, through interfaces that are, are user friendly. But it makes it very hard to reproduce analysis independently to, to, to scrutinize your computations and also to basically to uh, run your own R scripts or your own R time series model on something like that. There is a couple of a uh, couple of um, uh, projects, OpenEO and OpenEO Platform, uh, funded by the European Commission, and now the second one by the European Space Agency, uh, that that are part of a larger initiative for allowing reproducible, meaning open source and vendor independent computing on large cloud-based data archives. And we are also involving R there in the sense that we want to be able to basically run our scripts, run our code on the, on the, pixel, on the pixel level of these, these data sets. Um, and these projects have all contributed to something that is also of interest, that is the stack, a spatial temple asset catalog, which is basically formal description of a catalog that allows you to find imagery. And the question is you would say, you know, finding data, yeah, how do I find data? I go to a cloud and I ask for a directory listing. Yeah, but if there are like 50 million images in this directory, right? Because it is a, it's a document store, then this is not going to work, right? So you, end, you wait endlessly before you get it and then you get directory listing and then the directory listing is like 50 gigabytes. And you think what I'm going to do with that, right? So stack is a very lightweight and, and simple but in modern approach to basically finding uh, images, finding uh, and image collections. The idea of OpenEO is basically if we have all these kind of cloud platform, um, cloud storage ways of things, and then we have these software layers on top of them that, that, are, that are, here is Open Data Cube is a popular recent uh, modern one. All these software layers that have their own interface of, of allowing you to work with large imagery data and that this API basically be, uh, gives you a uniform front end where you can from different clients, quantum GIS or R or Python or web interfaces, basically you can access any back end through, uh, through a single client, basically carry out the same analysis, use the same script to run an analysis on this cloud or on that cloud and then see if they give you the same, uh, give you the same answer. This is a project that is actually, you know, I, I was one of the initiators, but it's much larger, it, it involves you know, it's like 10 programmers or so, 10 software engineers and a lot of institutional uh, support of, of, of organizations that actually run these clouds and, and are trying to make this data in these clouds uh, available to a wider user group. But the nice thing is that these, uh, that these uh, organizations actually see the, the need and see the benefit of, of, uh, of, of using this and are actually, while we are developing it, are actually using this in, in production so that it's, it's basically uh, not, not like uh, a proof of concept or a prototype or something, but it is something that they, that they think might be, uh, be viable, you know, if it, if it, uh, if it starts, to really, starts to really work. And right now we are at the stage we're close to probably in a couple of months or in one month or so, we, are, uh, we will be able to offer uh, public access to these kind of systems. And then, of course, you need to think about when people are starting to do massive computations that there is a cost to that, right? Cloud computing is not something that's for free. Um, and the next thing I'm going to talk about is that of the life cycle of uh, spatial packages. Um, spatial, you know, our packages have a life cycle. Yeah, this is, I think it, it, it might be something that, that the R Studio community came up with, like, you know, this is experimental, this is mature, this is uh, retired. And if you are, you know, somewhat familiar with the R Spatial community and you follow the RC Geo mailing list, not, you know, not everyone these days follows mailing lists, but this is a mailing list that has been around for over, for, for, nearly, for nearly 20 years and that uh, Roger Biven has uh, actually uh, has managed all the time, then you can see, you, you would have been able to see in his, uh, in his email signatures that he is now an emeritus professor. Yes, that, so that means essentially that Roger retired from, uh, from his job. Yeah, and people who retire, uh, they actually deserve to, uh, you know, to enjoy their retirement and to, to take on, uh, you know, the good things, the good things in life. And that might be, you know, that might be answering questions on our mailing list and so on. But one of the sort of harder things in life, uh, they are allowed, they are entitled to actually drop that. Yes. 
So um, reacting on this uh, announcement of my keynote, at least when the, when the abstract also came up, I, I commented that in my abstract it says, um, when Argidal and Argeos retire in 2024. So that was a bit of an announcement that um, I made. I, co I, I, I um, coordinated this with, uh, with Roger and actually we started talking about this five years ago. And Argidal and Argeos basically formed, together with SP, formed sort of the, the first foundations for, for, spatial, for our spatial packages. Argidal did the I.O., the reading of vector and raster data, and Argeos did all the geometry, of, of course, in two dimensions, but, but you know, did basically there, with that, you had the components that, that would build you, that would give you a GIS. Um, and I said, anyone volunteering to take over maintenance uh, should contact Roger. And uh, Roger uh, answered, I'm not sure that taking over maintenance is a sensible use of effort and add map tools to that list, right? So that is, that is a clear sign that uh, there needs to be... Uh, so we have been working actually uh, on working hard on, on replacements, on modern, more modern uh, invocations of, of the same ideas of SP and Argeda, and that is basically in SF stars, and there is now the Terra packages, the, the Terra package from Robert Hammonds, that is a replacement for the raster package. Raster uses Argidal really for, for reading and writing, and Terra uh, includes um, includes the GDAL directly links to the GDAL uh, library, so it does not does not use Argidal the R package for that. Uh, this is the same thing that the ASF package does. And um, so this is basically a, a signal, right, that everyone should take serious. Um, our spatial is an, um, is, an, is is really an, uh, a very open ecosystem that is that is uh, uh, relatively uh, relatively complex in the sense that um, for doing this, as I mentioned already, for doing these geometrical operations, we do with you know intersections or unions or buffers and so on about geometries, uh, but also for reading and writing data and for um, for doing, for handling coordinate reference systems and so on, we use a lot of uh, you, we use a lot of tools, a lot of infrastructure that is essentially used by a much wider uh, community, the, the open source spatial uh, community. I would I would say, and um, that is we do that uh, on purpose. Yeah, right. You could you could use you could write your own projection library. There is a there, I mentioned earlier there is this map project uh, library. And there was another library that had projections in it. The thing that you can do it, of course, some projections are simple and are, you know, you can write a five-liner or a ten-liner R package that does it. The thing is that does it keep up with all the other kind of the other changes of the world? And it is very convenient that the that the, um, the sort of all the people working with open source spatial open source software for spatial data essentially look at, at a limited number of, uh, of, of libraries and focus their effort in making them good and agreeing on what they do and what they should do and how things can be improved. And it, that is basically uh, depicted in this image, which just sketches the dependencies of the SF package. And, uh, you know, for the Terra package, this would be similar. It would also link to GEOS and to Proj and GDAL. Um, and so those, these, these three GDAL for, for IO, for reading, writing, vector and raster data approach for handling coordinate reference systems and for computing transformations. So doing projections, but also datum transformations, which is one, you know, one level more complicated. That's basically going from one model of an ellipsoid of the earth to another model of the ellipsoid, which is an approximate, uh, which is an approximate operation uh, as opposed to projection, which is basically a mathematical formula. Uh, the project in the GEOS library, which does two dimensional geometry, uh, those are all um, uh, the, the main sort of the main workhorse. Uh, if you would use PostGIS or Quantum GIS, or if you would use a Python package that does anything spatial, uh, like Pandas or PyProj or Raster.io, or all these all these Python packages use the same exactly the same libraries, and and so they all look at you know the same mailing lists and communicate with the same set of developers that 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 uh, that work on that. Um, recently, uh, the GDAL project has actually secured a lot uh, of structural funding through, uh, I think, through NumFocus, but also the, the, the organization that also does uh, does NumPy, and and they they managed to secure folks because there is so much infrastructure in this in this world. Also, all these these cloud platforms like Earth Engine and the Microsoft Variety or so, all basically 
lean on using GDAL for reading and writing cloud optimized geotiffs and so on. Nobody's going to duplicate those, those efforts. Other libraries are NetCDF uh, for array data and UD units for handling units and S2 geometry, which is basically the spherical geometry library that is a contribution, an open source contribution by Google. So that essentially powers also the, is, is the geometry engine behind Google Maps, Google Earth, Google Earth engine and so on, and Google BigQuery GIS. GDAL is, is a very complicated uh, uh, dependency in the sense that it's like a meta library that, that uses some, something like 100 other libraries for actually reading things. So there's libtiff and libgeotiff and so on, and SQLite 3 for write, reading and writing geo packages, etc. So this is a, a complicated thing also for package managers if you direct the link to that. And there is very valuable work from, for instance, Simon Urbanek on, on uh, we're, uh, realizing this on, uh, on the, the OSX binaries and, um, and also Brian Ripley works, where, uh, helps a lot in looking at, at versions of, of these new versions of these libraries. And Jeroen Ohms, who also does great work on the, the wind builder things. So, so making it easier for packages to basically link to, uh, to a very complicated dependency like, like GDAL. So that essentially brings me to uh, the end of my talk, to the conclusions, um, summarizing up. Uh, many data scientists will run someday into challenges with spatial data. One of the earliest challenges is then uh, that, of, that of projections, how to deal with that. Um, our spatial is an open and friendly community of people using our, the our package ecosystem for handling and analyzing spatial data. And there are a number of people in the R community um, that I just mentioned, but, but in particular also the cron team who have been very much instrumental in, in making this thing succeed. It has, has taken a lot of effort from them and still takes a lot of effort to, to get these packages all the time running with new versions of everything. Um, and, this, and, and we are successful, I think, because we, we use and we interface a lot of software that is used by a much larger community. So we, we basically reuse it, we, we, we can talk about the same thing. Uh, a large part of that is the OSGO Foundation, the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. And we are trying now with our spatial to become a community project with a number of key spatial packages, become a community project in the OSGO organization. So we have closer, we, 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 we develop closer contacts with them. Uh, Robin Loveless have been, has been very instrumental in setting that up. And we are also uh, having an R spatial panel session at the Phosphor-G, the free and open source software for geospatial World Conference, which is held this fall in uh, uh, online in uh, Argentina. Uh, as I mentioned, the SF package, which is you know the uh, the sort of the new, I would say central sort of holder, reader, writer of of spherical of, of uh, geometrical of, of vector data, now uses uh, spherical geometry, which is a new thing. So we need to th think about straight lines. They may need noding at some stage. We may want to automate it at some point or, or not. We have to figure that out. Um, um, you can do simplifying, but only after projecting in, in your target projection. Um, and we may want to automate this noting, as I said, at some stage. Um, as I implied already a little bit, we, I think we should really reconsider the way we, we do, the way we plot data now. If, if data is unprojected, if it is in latitude, longitude degrees, we still choose some projection, we choose plot carré, which is a bad thing, I think. So we should get rid of it and do other things. And also for smaller regions, do different things, probably an orthographic as the S2 plot uh, library by, uh, by Dewey Dunnington already does. Yeah, after all, strings as factors is also no longer true. That, that took 25 years, but you know, it's never too late to, uh, to reconsider. And anyway, the spherical geometry was a, was a big step and I think a large improvement. Um, analyzing large spatial data sets is and will remain a challenge because you know, because there is the whole cloud uh, sort of administrative thing involved and there is, there is data sets that, that uh, all the time become larger. And we have this retirement, not only of Roger Biven, but also of the RGL and RGOS uh, packages that will happen in 2024. And it has strong consequences. We have been working on good alternatives. They're there. Um, and uh, these three packages, other might be others and uh, users, users and developers uh, we'll have to migrate to uh, to these new packages, uh, and that there are quite a uh, there is there's a, a large number of packages at this moment still depending on on RGDOS, RGDAL or RGOS. So uh, there's a lot of work to do that we we will be happy to help with. 
So that was that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you, Edza, for the very interesting keynote, taking us through projections, large data sets, and life cycle of uh, spatial packages. We have a lot of interesting questions coming up, and I would encourage attendees to keep posting their questions in Q&A, upvoting any questions that you might want asked. Uh, and probably I'll be the first to ask um, a question that I have. You have given an interesting discourse on uh, projections. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder whether uh, the R spatial community do take great keen in choosing what projection to use when they are doing a specific type of analysis. Maybe this analysis is good for this projection and analysis B is good for this projection. And if not, why that might be not the case of taking into consideration that I should be using a type of projection for my R spatial analysis. Um, yeah, that is a good that is a good uh, question, Peter. I, uh, I'm you know I'm also not the projection expert. Um, I just you know have been sort of hiding all the time and saying, well, we do this because we always did that, right? And and that is basically the case now. So I think the case we have now the situation for default projections. Uh, plots of defaults for for unprojected data is very unlucky and that we can improve there and I think anything that's equal area is there a much better idea than what we do now which is very non-equal area because a lot of larger area plots even if you are doing global predictions of above ground biomass or something like that or, or, or maps of forest forest coverage or something like that equal area is always better because it represents equal areas areas as equal so you're not sort of blowing up one part of the world where where it looks that you have you know very low predictions and and and, and in decrease in other parts where you have very large. So so it is I think even if it's not about political data, uh, equal area is much better. If if even if it's land miles or ocean coverage or something like that, it is it's just a much better idea. Thank you. Um, and I'll go direct to the Q&A. There is a question that has been upvoted here by many attendees. Mm -hmm. And the question is, uh, learning R spatial is a huge challenge for most students. Uh, and the, Michael is asking, could you suggest two to three skills that are most important to uh, spatial analysis data in, uh, later in your career or job? Um, yeah. So uh, let me think about that. Um, I think that um, I think that that understanding uh, geometries and and what you can do with them is is a very useful uh, useful um, uh, approach. So we we do that in the introductory chapters of of the of the upcoming book. Uh, basically, thinking of measures like area, length, distance between objects, and what the, what does it mean. What is a what does a polygon mean or a set of polygons? What does that mean? What's a hole in a polygon, and and how they are how they are represented? Representation is not so very important, but kind of what are the implications, and then how do two geometries relate? Right? What are the possible mm -hmm. relations? Do they touch? Do they overlap? What does intersect mean? Are they disjoint? What you which words do you use for these kind of concepts? And the next step is kind of how do you use these things in analysis? Right. How are we going? How are we going to use that in, in analysis? I think those those skills are are useful. That is that is sort of one angle, and the other angle is obviously raster analysis. So handling uh, raster data in 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 a sensible way and doing operations on that. Thanks for the insights. Um, more questions are coming. Uh, a very important question here. What is the relationship between stars and Terra now and in the future, since both seem replacements for Rasta? Yeah, they're not entirely replacements for Rasta. Um, so there is, I think that Terra is really meant, is, is written as a replacement for Rasta because it has the same author and he also moves parts of the code base from Rasta to, to Terra for obvious reasons. Um, and stars is, has a little bit of a different uh, a different um, uh, uh, idea, yeah. That is more the idea of of we have uh, array data, and array data is a somewhat more generic uh, concept than uh, than raster data because we could also have like if we have time series of of polygons or time series associated with points, right? You can't put them in raster data, but you can put them in stars objects. So we 
you basically have you know the spatial dimension and the temporal dimension and then how do you how are you going to do that are you going to put like columns next to each other the wide form or the long form both is very inconvenient the logical is basically an array where you have one dimension time and one dimension spatial features and and that so the stars object the, the stars model is is more that of uh of, of uh, arrays and high dimensional arrays or more than three dimensional arrays uh, so if you have like a, a time series of multispectral images then you have a time you have the x and y dimension of your images of your of your layers right and you have an, a spectral dimension and you have a time dimension so it's it's more sort of meant to do uh, those kind of things and and the terra is is more directly of um uh, aiming at, uh, at at raster stacks although it also includes now its own classes for vector data yeah so it's basically a, a one a one fits all package right and so robert and i have somewhat different uh uh, views on that. Obviously, stars probably uh, fits you know closer to to SF and to the sort of the tidyverse verbs that that I like to to work with and to implement. And and what he does in Terra closer matches what what he did in 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 Raster in this sort of a new and more performant uh, iteration uh, of that. So it is there's you know there's overlaps and there is differences. I cannot say anything about. Um, you know, I can, well, you can look at the number of lines of codes in Terra, it is like five times the number in, in stars probably, so there's much more, uh, but then, you know, stars reuses a couple of things very cleverly and it is just different. You just need to see what is best for your purpose, I think. Yeah, and, and, and a slight uh, follow-up to that question, Lee is asking, who, in which life st st cycle stage is the current stars package? Oh, that is a very good question. Yeah, because it is it's kind of a zero something, zero five, uh, uh, zero five uh, version. So I think it is. It can be used for serious work. Um, there is just some some things that work, don't work that easily, right? Some some of the things work really good for smaller rasters that they are kept in memory. I think it works great. Uh, for larger rasters, a lot of things, you know, for things that it, it, that are really have to be kept on, on, on disk because they're way too large to be handled in memory. Uh, a lot of things work, but not everything works, right? There's a lot of things where the idea is, is right, but then you run into the implementation and basically things, things not always work. But, they, they, you know, it is sometimes the case with, with Terra maybe as well, I don't know. So I, yeah. it's, it is, it's a hard, yeah, so it, it's, it's uh, I, you know, if people run into problems, then please respond with issues on, on GitHub or the mailing list, that, that, that really works good. So help us progress the, both things. Yeah, and a lot of interesting questions keep coming. Um, you mentioned uh, about the special data science book and uh, a lot of people are wondering when it will yeah. be released. Uh, right. So the uh, it is already. So the things that we are writing is, is you know, it's slight delay is uh, is already available on um, on uh, online and it will remain available online. Um, uh, but we are we are basically um, um, finishing up the the first complete uh, text that we are going to submit in the next weeks. So that would be, you know, then it needs to go to review and it needs to go in editing again and then it needs to go in print. So so print versions will, will not be there within six months, I expect. Yeah, this always takes a lot of time. Um, yeah, and, and thanks for availing the book online for people who would like to see the soft copy before the hard copy. Um, another question is, uh, could you elaborate a bit on the challenge of linking R with QGIS and GEE? Are these very doable? Um, linking R with quantum GIS, yes, there is, I think there is, uh, there is different, there have been different attempts uh, to do this. Uh, one way would be to use GIS in, essentially and to do R as a processing engine. And the other way would be the other way around where you use R as your client basically and then call uh, quantum GIS processes, right? That, that might involve other GIS software like, like whatever Saga GIS or something like that. So there are a number of packages, and I don't know how how stable there are. The, these are there is this, this new thing by again by Dewey Dennington, I think called quantum GIS processes. And I'm I myself I'm not a quantum GIS user, so I I try to do everything with R and see where things break down. Um, for GIE, there's also a package called RGE, which I think is is kind of an 
an, an R interface to the Python interface to, uh, to uh, Google Earth Engine. I think it uses Reticulate to translate um, uh, commands, to translate instructions and to, uh, to obtain objects uh, back. Uh, and that I hear, hear people uh, hear good stories about that. Yeah, that mm. is very useful. Yeah, thanks. And I think that that question by Nita is an interesting one, given that, like me, I started from ArcMap, QGIS, and mm -hmm. when we tend to migrate to R, we always wonder, do we have something that can link us up instead of having like a baptismal by fire and going direct to the other one, having started to the graphical user interfaces kind of softwares? Right. Yeah, yeah, they are they are important, and there's a number of things that I can imagine that you really want to do with Quantum GIS, and you want to keep going doing with Quantum GIS. It's it's good software. It is also it is also complicated software, right? It is mm -hmm. another uh, you know hangs together on a lot of things, and then combining it with R is is a challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Luca is asking, is there any dots about let SF works as with data dot stable? Um, yeah, that's a good question. There's an um, there's one or two issues that that some of them might still be open or not on on the SF uh, GitHub side and also on the data table side. I heard um, Tim Appelhans, the author of MapView, was successful in doing these things. I think you can in data tables you can handle um, SFC, so you can handle uh, geometry list columns. Right, so that basically means you can also, you know, work with data frames and have a geometry list column in them. And then they're not SF objects, but of course they carry on their their geometry. You can you can work with that, right, or or tables or so. So that is similar. Uh, the thing where it breaks down is that uh, SF tries to basically take over a number of methods from data table and does it not entirely the way data table likes to do it. So there is, I think, there are some some conflicts uh, if you want to sort of work uh, with SF objects. That basically are proxies. Uh, that, that are our data table objects. I think there are some some conflicts there. I'm not entirely sure whether we can resolve that. I also uh, haven't seen people putting much effort in that, right? And mm -hmm. and I I didn't do it. And so that simply has somebody has to sort it out. I have the feeling. Mm -hmm. I think it can be done, but but you know because it's R, anything can be done. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Who will yeah, do it? We, right. This yeah. is the question. Who will do it? Yeah, and we, we have a few minutes to the end of the session. We have about 10 minutes to go. And uh, I, I see some concerns, people asking about access to Slack, where the conversation can go on. I know Rusio will probably mention towards the end on how people can access it and if the email has been sent out. Um, a further question here by Gabriel that has, of, has also been wondering about, and he says that I've played with spatial data in R for a few years, not many, and have found interesting packages of great value that grow on their own. Is it on the roadmap for R spatial to integrate all of them into a broader ecosystem? Yeah, that is an interesting question. Um, and and um, the question is done, what, what is an ecosystem, right? And uh, in ecosystem, you have collaboration, but you also have competition. And competition can also be very healthy. Right can be a very good thing, and of you know things in ecosystems grow and are, have success and are big, and then and then after some stage they retire or they die or something like that or they get killed or whatever. You know you couldn't uh, something yeah. happened and and somebody found something on Cron and you, you never could solve it and then it falls apart. Right, so we are not like um, if I think of you know if um, if I think of of the sort of the R Studio the tidyverse. Uh, packages as a successful ecosystem, you have to think that there is a there is a, like whatever hundred uh, software engineers, a large number of people with the, that are very highly skilled that basically have all their they can put all their effort in doing that, right? And if you look at what our special who they, who we are and the amount of time that we have for package development, then then we are much smaller. So it is actually uh, it is you know it is a miracle that we, I think, that we got, that we are now where we are. And um, in that sense, you have to think also about uh, capacity. And of course, we, you know, we, we get occasionally some, some, some seed money from the R consortium for things, but we don't have like capacity in the sense of software engineers working uh, consistently or constructively on things. Yeah, so uh, of, of the competition, we already, you know, we, I mentioned the stars and Terra thing where there is a certain overlap of things 
uh, I think that's good. And the thing is that uh, uh, Robert and I, you know, we work very differently. And Robert is really somebody who focuses on on software and makes something that is brilliant and that does everything right. And but he's he's not like you know he's not constantly uh, communicating with everyone. How shall we do this? How shall we do this? And that kind of thing, right? That is he's yeah. it's a different way of of doing things. And that that creates brilliant products that are just not you know that that are then also there and and there's alternatives so that makes it maybe easy it would maybe easier for for users if we were like clear if every all the developers were clear you should do that with that and that with that and that with that and that with that and that's now not the case right but i think that is in general a, a, a characteristic of the of, of of our community um of, of many our communities because um, a lot of packages are very much individual contributions Right, and you do what you what, what you know what you burn for, and and, it, and, you, and how you think you should do it, and then take it or leave it. Right, mm -hmm. so so that is one of the struggles that you have to to deal with. I think that this it is fairly similar in the in the Python world, where where things are even much less coherent, I think, than in the R world. Thanks for the reflection and insights. Also, somebody here is having some reflection and saying it is humbling to be reminded how difficult it is to define a straight line on a sphere. Then he is asking, given all the existing knowledge of geometry and calculus we have, does it fascinate you that sometimes that we are still grappling with the problem of figuring out how to code and represent data in 3D on a sphere? No, I don't. I think I'm, I'm very optimistic. I look at it from a different side. So I'm... The, the reason there, I, I struggle so much in explaining this is, is it's it's hard to comprehend first to to think on, on spheres as, as sort of uh, um, you know unless you're a mathematician being grown up have studied geometry or something like that. Uh, but um, the, I think it's the legacy. It's I think it's the 50 years that we've worked with two day two D you know with with global data essentially on the on the two square flat screen right. And, and that we now see, no, of course, Google started 15 years ago not doing that. They didn't sort of look at what the GIS community had done. They just said, oh, we're going to solve this problem, right? And then they said, oh, well, here we have this library anyone can use. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it's a matter of, of catching up. And, and the, the, the difficulties are really coming from the legacy, from how we've done it all the time. And, and from these, you know, these things written in the GeoJSON standard where, where you think, why on earth, right? Why on earth would somebody write that down that way? And maybe, yeah, maybe it's a good idea. We'll see. We just have to see sort of how, how things develop. And I think they're, they're, they're getting better. Um, and probably here taking the last question before I welcome Rusio to talk us about if, if the Slack and all things are working now. Um, Colin is asking anything around support for discrete global grid system in R. Yeah, there is uh, basically the um, the um, the S two library that we are using essentially has a grid index it has an, an it has a, a, a six phase cube and then uh, quadris on these are, are, are sort of space filling curves on these on these cube faces that is essentially an indexing structure structure so it has an it has an an, an index that works effectively on the sphere uh, other systems are uh, h3 there is there are several h3 packages r packages linking to the javascript linking to the c libraries uh, that are recently so there was also uh, that do hexagonal grids. Um, there is also a DG uh, grid R uh, package that has now been archived because it there were problems in the in in, in the the C C plus plus libraries it, it used uh, written by Richard Richard Barnes that is now in, in archive but you can still uh, get it from there and install it on, on your computer. So there are several uh, several packages actually uh doing this in in various for various purposes and with various interfaces yeah um th th thank you uh, i'll stop taking the questions at this moment and i'd like to take this opportunity to uh thank you uh, for taking us through and answering all the questions that we had those that have not been answered i hope people can come continue on the slack um and at the moment i would wish to Welcome, Rusio, to tell us about Slack, if people have been able to access and how to go about it. And again, thank you to our sponsors for the day, Epsilon, uh, and uh, App Projected. You can see the upcoming sessions for your information. Uh, over to you, Rusio. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edser, for this great talk, and Peter for being such a, an amazing chair. Um, just for the people who missed the, the messages at the beginning, we have sent all of the participants an email invitation to Slack. Uh, please check your spam in case you have not seen that. And if you have missed it anyway, for any reason, probably your fault, uh, please uh, communicate, send us an email uh, through ConfTool or, you know, any, uh, any email that, that you should be able to communicate with us. Um, the many people have already entered the new Slack space. So please, uh, it is very similar to, uh, what we had at the lounge. So there's one channel per session. And, uh, at the beginning, you're not going to see the whole list of channels, but you're going to see, um, you're going to be able to uh, click on plus and then see the whole list uh, there. So um, see you there. Thank you for your patience. And um, yeah, see you soon.